We continue a series this morning that we started last week called Be Rich. Now, this morning I want to give a disclaimer. This is not original material to us. Andy Stanley, who pastors North Point Community Church in Alpharetta, Georgia, one of the greatest churches in this country. Andy's one of the best communicators in the church world today. A couple of years ago, wrote a book called Be Rich, and it really was born out of a message series that they had been doing every year at their church starting several years ago ago and kind of finally, it was actually Craig Goshell, pastor of Life Church here in Oklahoma City that kept pressuring Andy Stanley to put this into book form. So he wrote a book called Be Rich and a lot of the material that we're using in this series comes from the book. And the reason that it captivated me is because every year in North Point, they do this Be Rich campaign where they, they, they teach about giving, they teach about generosity and then receive an offering in their church and then they turn around and use every dollar that comes in through their Be Rich campaign and they pour it right back into their community. And this last year in 2014, in November 2014, North Point Community Church received $5 million from their church people and then turned around and poured every dollar of that right back into their community. Now this morning, that's the kind of church that we want to be. That is the heart that drives Genesis Church. We have this passion that if we shut our doors and the community did not notice, then we have failed as a church. We want to live and exist in such a way that our community needs us to be in this community to help shape it and move it in a direction that's going to help people and bring glory to God. So when I, uh, over the years, I've listened to Annie Stanley and his Be Rich campaign, and I read the book, and finally I was like, you know what? We're going to take this, and we're moving somewhere. We were so passionate about this Sunday that I was like, if we have to, if we're snowed out, then I'm going to be here, and Ryan's going to be here with his video camera, and I'm going to preach to a camera so we can post this on the internet because we believe this series is so important because we're going somewhere with this, and we're going to let you in on that a little bit more next week. But now that we have a captive audience this week, let's track along of what we're going to talk about today. Next week, we looked at this idea, we celebrated the idea that we're rich. Matters, honestly, we didn't really celebrate a whole lot because nobody really wanted to own up to the idea that we're rich because we don't feel rich. This morning, we don't want to declare that we're rich because we don't feel rich. And we're going to talk about that pretty head on this morning. But we talked about the statistic this morning that if you make $40,000 you're in the top 4% of income earners in the world. You're better off than 96% of the over 7 billion people on this planet. And if you're fortunate enough to make $48,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of income earners in the world. You're better off than 99% of the over 7 billion people that call this planet home. You're rich. You're filthy rich. You're elite rich. You are privileged rich. But I know what you're thinking. I'm not rich. And you don't think you're rich because you don't feel rich. And I understand this morning, I don't feel rich. You know, just this week, I was reviewing, it's the end of the month, we were reviewing our budget, and I was like, you know, texting my wife, why'd you buy at Walmart on this day, and this day, and this day, and Target? No, I didn't, I do that, and it drives her crazy, but, you know, that's just, just how my mind works. But I don't feel rich. I mean, I'm looking at expenses, and I'm like, what, what, what do we spend? And then we got a baby, and those things are expensive. I mean, this, this is our third one. This is the first one that we've had to put on formula. And this week I had to go to the grocery store and buy two canisters of formula. And I was going through receipts and I saw that Serena bought two canisters of formula just two weeks ago. And I was like, dear Lord, the baby's expensive. You know, I'm like, so I was like, Allie, hey, next month you're going to whole milk, baby. And mommy and daddy are getting a pay raise. I mean, it's kind of like no more for me. And then I'm like, then it's potty training. I, I don't care if you can talk, walk. We're going to start setting your little bottom on the toilet. And we're going to get another pay raise because we're going to quit buying diapers. But I get it this morning. We don't think we're rich because we don't feel rich. But this morning, here's the thing. Most of the problems that you and I face are rich people problems. Most of the problems that we face revolve around what to do with the things that we want and not the things that we need. 
The vast majority of our money problems today don't revolve around providing and acquiring things that we need. They revolve around acquiring the things that we want. And that simple truth is what sets us apart from the vast majority of the world. That simple truth is what makes you and I rich. And this morning, even if you're not rich, maybe you're like, I don't make 40,000 and I definitely don't make $48,000 a year. You still must admit that you're blessed because you've been born into the richest times of the richest country on this planet with more possibilities and potential to become rich than anybody else in the world. This morning, you and I are rich. This morning, we have rich people problems. You know, for the vast majority of the world, it's really easy to figure out what to do with their resources. They go work all day so that they can eat. I mean, it's simply slave labor, 12, 14, 16 hours a day, just so they have some rice or beans or something to put on the table for their family. You and I, we go work all day, and then we come home and we face the decision, do I want to cook? Do I want to pick up dinner on the way home? Or do we want to go somewhere and pay somebody else to fix us dinner? It's rich people problems. Rich people do all kinds of crazy things. Maybe you've heard of some of this. Rich people have been known to take a perfectly good iPhone to a store and stand in line for hours. And while they'll wait, they'll even talk, text, and play games on their phone while they wait to pay money so that they can take home a different, perfectly good iPhone. Crazy. Rich people problems. Rich people have been known to drive a perfectly good car to a car store and pay somebody money so that they can drive a different, perfectly good car home crazy. Rich people have been known to take a perfectly good refrigerator, stove, microwave, and dishwasher out of their kitchen and throw it all away and replace it with a perfectly good refrigerator, stove, microwave, and dishwasher. Crazy. I know, rich people problems. Rich people have been known to walk into the room that they keep their clothes in and fret and stress about the fact that they don't have anything to wear. And it will bother them so much that they will go to a store full of clothes and buy new clothes and take those clothes home. I'm not talking about just women. Hold on, brother. So... And they, they will take those new clothes back to their room full of clothes. And then two months later, they will walk back into the room full of clothes. And they will stress out over the fact they have nothing to wear. Crazy. I know rich people problems. Now, I know nobody in this room can identify because we're not rich. And we would love to have some rich people problems. Think about it this way. This morning, I stopped at Starbucks. Any Starbucks fans in the room? Some of you are like, I'm not going to say a word because I don't know where you're going with this. <laughs> you're catching on. This morning at Starbucks, I paid $5.15 for overpriced burnt coffee, right, Paul? <laughs> so, <laughs> you hush, woman. You have no room to speak of your Dr. Pepper addiction, so you, <laughs> you be quiet. That's my wife in the back. For those that don't know, she is highly addicted. She has an addiction for seeking therapy and help for Dr. Pepper. She has a drinking problem. I'm just going to start saying that. <laughs> I'm just going to start saying, this is my therapy. My wife has a drinking problem. It's not intoxicating, but it is very expensive. Um, once a week, baby, not every day at Sonic. It, even happy hour, it adds up. So oh, that's even better. My wife has a drinking problem, and she always stops at happy hour. This is, <laughs> this is getting good. Let me write that down. All this is being recorded. That's good. So... So this morning at Starbucks, $5.15. I know some of you non-Starbucks people are like, that's retarded. And you're right, it is. But, but get this today. 40% of the world, approximately 2.6 2 billion people that live on our planet live on less than $2 a day. 40% of the people on this planet would have to work at least two and a half days to afford a cup of coffee. 70% of the people on this planet, over 5.15 billion people, live on less than $10 a day. People that would have to work for two days to be able to afford a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Rich people problems. Rich people problems. This morning, we are 
a blessed people. We are a blessed people and we have to ask the question, have we been blessed for our sake or for something more? We have to ask the question, have we been blessed for our sake or for something more? Last week we looked at this scripture found in 1 Timothy. Paul was writing instruction to a young leader in the church named Timothy. And he he told Timothy, he said, look, you're going to have people in your congregation that are blessed. You're going to have people in your congregation that are rich. And you need to teach them how to be good at being rich. So we looked in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. It says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then verse 18 is the kicker. Command them to do good. This is how to be good at being rich. Command them to do good to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Paul told Timothy, he said, look, you've got to teach the rich people in your congregation. And look, I realize today, some of you don't think you're rich, but just in case you ever find yourself in the position of calling yourself rich, we wanna learn how to be good at being rich. And Paul says, look, Timothy, there's two areas of wrong thinking. There's two attitudes that work against us ever being good at being rich. And it's this, that wealth makes us arrogant, that as our net worth goes up, our our sense of self-worth goes up and we begin to think that we are somebody because we have more money than others, we begin to think that we're better than other people, that because we have nicer stuff or a nicer car or a bigger house, we begin to view ourselves as a little smarter, a little better looking, a little better than those other people, that money makes us arrogant. And not only that, but money has its own sense of gravitational pull, that when we have wealth, when we have means and ability, we have a tendency that our hope begins to migrate and we begin to put our hope in our riches rather than our hope in God. And Paul said, look, Timothy, those two areas of wrong thinking are gonna cause your people to not ever be good at being rich because if we don't think right, we can't do right. So last week we talked about two attitudes that will help us become good at being rich. And they were these, number one, I will be grateful. Arrogance says I deserve this. But gratefulness, gratitude says, no, 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 I don't deserve this, but I'm incredibly grateful, I'm incredibly thankful that I do have what I have. And an attitude of gratitude will keep us from ever becoming arrogant, no matter how much wealth or riches that we ever accumulate. And the second one is this, is that I will lead with generosity that instead of letting my hope migrate to the uncertainty of riches, I'm going to lead the way in generosity because Jesus said my heart will be where my treasure is. So I'm going to move my treasure toward that which God values so that my heart will follow and my values will be aligned with what God values. Basically, the key is this. The key to being good at being rich is being able to possess money without money possessing us. If we're going to be good at being rich, we've got to be able to possess money without money being able to possess us. And this morning, we're going to look at a parable found in the gospel of Luke chapter 12. Luke is one of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which tell the story and the life of Jesus. So if you want to turn with us this morning to the gospel of Luke chapter 12, we're going to look at a story that Jesus told that teaches us how to possess money without money possessing us. And this morning, if you don't have a Bible or a, a Uh, electronic device with a Bible app. We'll put the words on the screen so you can follow along with us this morning. We're going to pick up in verse 13. And this whole whole story begins with a conversation that verse 13 says, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So the conversation is about money here. 
He's got a brother that obviously their parents have died. They come into an inheritance. One brother's trying to hang on to it. It's trying to not share with the other brother. And he's coming to Jesus saying, hey, you need, to, you need to be the mediator. You need to work this out for us. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me as judge or arbiter between you? That, that's not my role. That's not for me to say who needs to take what. But in that context, Jesus says this. Jesus said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then Jesus tells a story. But this morning we need to understand the context of the story is greed. Is this desire to have what we do not possess. And also the idea of the warning that uh, life does not consist in the abundance of our uh, possessions that no matter how much wealth, how much riches we're able to accumulate, although they may be able to produce uh, joy and happiness and opportunity. I mean, think about it. If you have a boat and you go to the lake for the weekend, you're going to have fun. If you have a boat and you go to the lake, you need to invite me next time you go to the lake and then we can have fun and bring glory to God together through a shared fun experience. But Jesus warned against the idea that money, riches, and possessions can give us fulfillment or satisfaction. Sure, they can bring us happiness. They can provide us opportunities to do things that we enjoy, but they can never satisfy the soul. So it's in this context that Jesus tells this parable. He says, the ground of a certain rich man. So here we have a man who already has plenty who's already arrived at a place that Jesus describes it as wealth, as riches. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So here we find a man who already has enough to meet all of his needs has come into more money, more wealth, more possessions. Maybe it was, maybe for some of us in a modern context, it's the tax return that turned out to be bigger than what we expected. For maybe somebody in sales, it's just a really incredible month, really incredible quarter, and our bonus check, our commission check was bigger than what it's ever been. Maybe we work at a company that just had a banner year and everybody gets stock incentives or some kind of bonuses or some sort. Whatever it is for you, somebody that already had enough has come into more. And at some point, we all have to ask the question, how much is enough? How much is enough? How much house is enough? How big of a payment do I want to pay for a car that essentially just drives me back and forth to work? How much is enough? Do I really need, really need the upgrade if the one I already have works just fine? Sure, my iPhone 5 is a whole lot slower than what I would like it to be, but do I really need the iPhone Plus? At some point, we all have to ask the questions, how much is enough? enough because here is a man who already has enough to meet all of his needs, who already has excess, who already has extra, and now he's coming to more. So he's asking the question, what shall I do? I don't have room for all this. How am I going to spend this? What am I going to buy? What am I going to inquire? Where am I going to invest this? What am I going to do with our extra? Because the truth for probably everybody in this room today is that we don't, ever, we don't ever find ourselves in a position of lack concerning our needs. And, and let me just add this today. If you do find yourself in that position where you're unable to provide legitimate needs for your family, please let us know. Please let us know. We're, we will not let children go to bed hungry in this church. If you are incapable of providing for the needs of your family, please do not hide yourself in shame or fear. Please speak up and let us know so that we can help. But for the vast majority of us today, we don't ever struggle to provide needs. We struggle to acquire wants. And here's the thing today. There's, there's, not, a fine, there's, there's not just a clear-cut line between needs and wants. Because sometimes our needs are satisfied. We just want a little better. You know, at the end of the day, you can live on ramen noodles for a while. I mean, you may not live long, but, but you can live on them. 
and, and your needs can be provided. We would just like a little better uh, for our needs to be satisfied. But there's no clear-cut line where you cross over from need to want. And there's no clear-cut line from where you cross over from want into excess as either, either. That's a question we all have to assess for ourselves. How much is enough? And what we need to understand today is appetites grow. There will always be something more. There will always be something better, bigger, newer, shinier, with more bells and whistles. There will always be the opportunity to reach up, to spend more, to continually strive for the next best thing because appetites grow. Appetites grow. And if we don't settle the question, how much is enough, it will never be enough. Jesus said, and then it says, then he said, this is what I'll do. I've got so much, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. What did Paul say to Timothy? That wealthy people, that rich people have a tendency to put their hope in their riches. And this is exactly what we see playing out. I will say to myself, I have plenty of good laid up for years to come. I am secure. I am set. Look at all that I have. I'm just going to rest. I'm going to take it easy. I've got it made. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Now listen, this is not saying that if you get a big raise, God's gonna kill you. This is not saying that if you get a big tax return, God's gonna smite you. This is not saying that if you don't give an offering today, that God's gonna kill you on the way home. At least I don't think that's what it's saying. I guess that could be a possibility. Roads are slick and things happen. I'm joking, I'm joking. Some people are like, whoa, hold on. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. But look, the context was greed. And listen to how Jesus defines greed. Jesus defines greed as the assumption that everything we have is for our consumption. Jesus said, look, you're greedy. You're greedy. And this is what's going to happen to everyone that's greedy, to everybody that looks at what they have and assumes that it's all for my consumption, that one day you're going to realize the foolishness of that attitude. Not that God's going to kill you, but you're going to realize that I've been foolish, that my attitude toward money, my attitude toward stuff was foolish. And Jesus defines greed as the assumption that everything we have is for our consumption. And this is what I know about you today. You don't want to be greedy. You don't want to be greedy. I would imagine the vast majority of people in this room today, you would say, I want to be a generous person. I want to be known as someone that's generous. We've all known arrogant rich people. We don't like those people. We don't like people that are arrogant. We don't like people that are stingy. We don't like people that are greedy. We don't like people that have the means but are never compassionate or never generous to other people. And we certainly don't want to be that person. We want to be generous. But the reason that most of us are not generous or as generous as we would like to be is simply because we don't have a plan to be. The reason most of us are not generous or as generous as we want to be is because we don't have a plan to be generous. And as in most cases in life, it's not that we plan to fail, we simply fail to plan. That we're not generous not because we've planned to not be generous, we've just never planned to be generous. And just like we talked about a couple weeks ago in our baggage series about wisdom, that it is our direction. It is our choices, not our intentions that determine our destination in life. Nobody becomes generous because they want to be generous. People become generous because they choose to be generous. We all have the desire, especially today, if you're a follower of Jesus, 
God is remaking you, reshaping you into his character, and God is a generous God. So if you're a follower of Jesus today, you have within you the desire to be generous, but the desire will never be enough because it is our direction, it is our choices that we make that determine our destination in life, not our intentions. We have to have a plan to be generous. So for the next few minutes this morning, I want to talk about how to have a be rich plan. How to have a be rich plan. Number one, to have a be rich plan, we have to have a plan to give. We have to have a plan to give. And that's the first step because we've got to lead in generosity. And we're going to talk a little in more detail about this next week. But you can, you can argue the tithe. You know, if you're a church person, you've heard the word tithe. And a tithe means 10%. We can argue the theology of the tithe and percentages all day. But the one thing we cannot argue about giving is the principle of first. Is the principle of first. That it is comes first that the only way to honor God with our resources is to give to God first. We can argue percentages all day, but you cannot argue the principle of first. And if we're gonna have a be rich plan, we've got to have a plan to give. Listen to what the apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter nine. To, to kind of set the stage, the apostle Paul had passed through the church at Corinth and then let them know of a need that existed with, with, with the churches in another region. There was another region, the region of Macedonia, Laodicea, that area was going through an extreme famine. They were extremely poor. And Paul had traveled from region to region, church to church, trying to raise support for the opportunity to meet this need. And the people of Corinth had said, hey, we're in. We're gonna be a part of that. We're gonna do something about that. So the apostle Paul writes back to them saying, hey, I'm about to pass back through and I wanna remind you of the commitment that you made to pitch in, to be generous, to help those that are in need. And in chapter nine and verse six, we pick up on what he's writing. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Again, he's writing to a predominantly agricultural society, but we get it today. If, if we were to take seed and go out to a field, it's very logical that if we scatter just a little bit of seed, we're only gonna get a little bit of a harvest, only a little bit of produce or, or, or stuff is gonna grow up. But if we scatter a whole lot of seed, then more than likely we're gonna be in line for a bigger harvest. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what is decided in his heart to give. We need to have a plan to give. Everyone should give what they have planned to give. Not reluctantly. You know, I've seen, I've been in my church my whole life, I've seen those people offering plate passes by and it's like, <laughs> Ah, you know, the usher, I was like, put them in an arm bar and, you know, pry the check or the offering envelope from their hand and put it in the offering plate or, you know, the people that are like, hey, can I make change, you know? Can I put a five in and get four ones out, you know? You know, not reluctantly or under compulsion. And, and can I just, I just, I just say this today. There's a lot of churches that they make people give under compulsion. They put a lot of pressure on people to give. That's not biblical. There's one particular church cha or channel that you can turn to and see 24 hours a day examples of that. I'm going to get in trouble this morning, but all kinds of pressure to give. Paul says, no, 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 no. God loves a cheerful giver. And if you give with a reluctant heart, God's not going to honor that. God's not going to bless that. You need to give what you've planned to give, not under compulsion, not become some preacher, somebody got on stage and manipulated into giving. And that will never happen here. It will never happen here because it's not biblical and God won't honor that. Not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And, and from this point forward, take notice of all of the places that talks about God's initiative, God's provision, God's ability, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having what? Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Basically, God is able to make sure that if you have a heart of generosity, you will have resources in your hands to give. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now look at verses 10 and 11. Now he who supplies, who's he referring? It's referring to God. Who's gonna supply it? 
God. We want to be generous. Who's going to supply our ability to be generous? God, not us, because, because it all belongs to him. It all belongs to him. It's not mine anyway. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, not only is God going to provide your ability to give, he's also going to provide for your needs. He's going to provide bread for food. He's going to make sure you have all that you need. Seed to the sower, bread for food, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And I love verse 11. You will be made rich. You're going to be made rich. You're going to be made rich by who? By God. You're going to be made rich, but look at this. In every way, so that. You're going to be blessed so that. You're going to be made rich so that. Your blessing has a greater purpose than your own needs, wants, and desires. You're going to be made rich so that you can be generous. We are blessed to be a blessing. Whew, that was a good opportunity for somebody to say amen. That's okay. That's okay. I'm one of those preachers. I don't need amens. I can keep going. And we've only got one service today, so I don't have to conserve energy for the second service. So hang on, babe. We can go all morning. I'm going to shut the timer down, and we're just going to carry on. No, 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 no. I'm joking. You're going to be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. There's a lot of us that we would love to be generous, but we don't have the ability to be generous because we've not made a plan so that we can be generous on every occasion. Isn't it heartbreaking to see a need or an opportunity and not be able to do anything about it? Can I tell you, that's not God's desire for you. That's not God's desire for you. Now, I know this morning you may be thinking, well, I need more. No, it, it could be not that you need more, that, but you simply need to consume less. Ooh, that's good preaching, but I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I don't want to make people angry on a snow day. So, and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Our be rich plan begins, but we got to have a plan to give. We are blessed to be a blessing. Number two this morning, we got to have a plan to save. If you consume everything that you acquire, you will never be able to be rich. You'll never be able to be rich. You've got to have a plan to save. Proverbs 21 and 20, in the house of the wise... In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man, what did, what did God call the rich man that thought it was all about him, that everything was for himself? You fool, but a foolish man devours all that he has. You see, most of us today, it's not, a, it's not an income problem. It's a consumption problem. It's a spending problem. And that's why we've got to ask the question, how much is enough? because I'll never be able to be rich. I'll never be good at being rich if I don't have a plan to save. Thirdly, we've got to have a plan to spend. And I know some of you are like, well, you got that covered. No, no, no. The plan is the key word. I know we all have the ability. Some of us have amazing ability at spending. The key word is we need to have a plan. Husbands, don't be nudging your wives. Wives, don't be pointing fingers at your husbands. I'm going to preach the rest of the service my eyes shut. No, we got to have a plan to spend. The idea here is a budget. Is a budget. I know that's like a cuss word for so many people. But a budget is simply telling your money where to go rather than wondering where it went. Anybody ever look at their bank account and be like, oh, where did it go? You know, I just got paid. You know, and it's like, whoa. You know, you look at it and it's, and it's red. And you're like, oh, Jesus. And if you didn't have a plan to spend, there may not be any black to cover that red. And then you find yourselves in a whole lot of trouble. But we gotta have a plan to spend. We gotta have a budget. I, I love this verse, and we gotta explain it a little bit. Proverbs 27 and 23. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks. Know where your sheep are. So I'm like, I don't have any sheep. No, we're getting there. Know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. Again, this was written to a very agricultural-based society, and, and their money, their wealth, their resources wasn't at First United Bank of whatever. It was in the sheep pen or it was in the cattle pen. And it would be foolish for any farmer to not know where his cattle are, where his sheep are, how many he has. You know, it's like, hey, I think somebody stole your sheep. Well, I don't know. I don't, I've got seven. I, I think I used to have 10. I'm not sure. We ate, see, we ate Betsy, Bessie, Sally. You know, I don't know. You know, you, to make sense in our day, we've got to know how much is coming in. We've got to know how much is going out. And can I help you? You need to have more coming in than is going out. I know some of you laugh, but our, our society does not believe that. 
We have this thing called credit that it doesn't matter how much you're coming in. We're going to let you spend as much as you want. And again, appetites grow. And if we don't ever ask the question, how much is enough, we'll keep spending even though we don't have enough to cover that. And some of us have been in that place. We've been in that place ourselves. Uh, Several years ago, I made a horrible investment decision that was debt financed. And boom, we're left holding the bag on a debt with no asset to cover it. And it was tough, tough times for several years in our family. And we learned a lesson. You can't butcher a sheep that you don't have. (laughs) You can't, and you you don't need to go steal somebody else's either. But you need to know the condition of your herds. You need to know what's coming in. You need to know what's going out. You need to know where it's going. And you need to know if that's a priority for you. You got to ask how much is enough. You got to have a plan to spend. Fourthly and lastly, you've got to have a plan to get free. And we're talking about debt. You got to have a plan to get free. Listen to what the writer of Proverbs said in 22 and 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. And we all know this. If you don't make a payment on something, you're going to get a nasty phone call. You don't make another payment on something, you're going to get a really nasty phone call. You don't make a payment again, somebody's coming to get your stuff because there are rules that you have subjected yourself to and you are a slave to the lender. We don't want to live that way. We can't be rich toward God if we're tied up in debt for a slave to other people. So we're blessed to be a blessing. We're blessed to be a blessing. We can't buy into this idea, this assumption that everything is for our consumption. We're rich, we're blessed, and we've got to learn how to be good at being rich. Now, I just want to to help you real quick before we close this morning. Every semester of Connect Groups, we do Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace. Some of you have heard about it. Some of you have been through it. We are committed to helping you win with money here at Genesis because we know the life-giving value of being generous, the value to you to be able to be generous and the life-giving value for those that we are generous toward. We want to help you develop a Be Rich plan. We want to help you be good at being rich so you can reap the benefits of being generous, of living in generosity. So every semester, as a matter of fact, uh, John, would you stand real quick? They've already started the semester. We'll find a way to let you jump in. If you have questions, you can see John after service. We want to help you live. Because what, what did Paul say? I don't have time to go back this morning. First Timothy 6 and 19, he said, look, Timothy, if you'll help them live this way, you'll help them lay hold of that which is truly life. Is that not what we are all after? That's what every person in this room is after today. You may not even be a Christian, but what you're after is that right there. We want to lay hold of that which is truly life, that which truly satisfies the soul and gives me a sense of purpose, a sense of passion. That's what we're all after. And the word of God says the key to that is to be good at being rich, is to live generously. And this morning, we want to help you be good at being rich. And this morning, we have been blessed to be a blessing. And I want to challenge you this week. Maybe you need to sit down and have a conversation with your spouse. And you need to start developing a plan. And the first question you need to ask is, how much is enough? How much is enough? How much is enough? What do we really need? And if we were to draw the line right here, what would that enable us to do in the realm of generosity. Would you stand?